Yes, I. This song is called Be the Change. Inspired by the words of Mahatma Gandhi, who lived for peace and not violence, and told us to be the change we wish to see in the world. Welcome to the 100th Monkey Radio with Tom and Ramon, and we are recording this on May 26, 2014. Uh, I guess it's May 26th and 27th, uh, since I'm kind of outvoted on the date tonight. Uh, We're coming to you from all over the planet this evening, and you'll understand that later on after we get through our our business end of the show here. Uh, So how's it going, Ramon? Uh, It's going pretty good. uh, Good. (laughs) It's going uh, pretty good. Uh, My... um, Plants are growing beautifully, and the yuzu is starting to um, the the yuzu citrus is starting to grow on the plant. Mm. So I'm happy about that. Nice, nice. I gave away a couple of big garbage or garbage bags full of lettuce the other day. Oh, nice! I walked around the neighborhood and gave it. Well, there's just one new family that moved in with a bunch of kids. Mother, a single mother. Uh, he's got like three kids, and he's like, oh, there's a good candidate for some of this lettuce. And uh, yeah, it's producing way more than I can eat. So, yeah, there we have that's, it. That's a, but that's the only I, thing I'm getting so far. Uh, well, you can always make, um, do the Korean style and make kimchi. Oh, yeah. It's, what, what it's do you, a pain do you, in the butt. You just throw it in a throw it in a bucket and. Um, yeah, they do something and they add spices and they let it for, they let it pickle and it's really uh, spicy, um, but it will last you a long time. Yeah, I think I'm gonna it. I think I'm gonna stay away from the kimchi. I don't think I've ever developed a taste for it. So. No, <laughs> no. Uh, so what's happening out in the world, Ramon? Oh man, I got uh, some amazing uh, news. But before I go into that, I want to read. You know how they in Facebook they put like little pictures and they right, say little right. things. And I saw this one and I loved it. It says, um, "In the age of information, ignorance is a choice." Mm, that's a good one. Yeah, that's a that really a good, good one, one. Yeah. especially with the things we cover here. Um, yeah, but absolutely. Uh, you know, saying this to our audience is singing to the choir. <laughs> but let's start off with one news that really uh, blasted my mind when I saw it. It's a three-year-old boy that remembers being murdered in a past life and leads adults to proof. Now, this is uh, somewhere in the border of Israel and uh, Syria. I think it's on the Syria side. Oh, it's in the Middle yeah. East, really. Yeah. And uh, according to the news, the, you know, in this village where he's from, it's kind of encouraged when a young boy starts talking about it. But basically, to make a long story short, uh, the boy starts talking about, I remember my past life, I remember where I'm from. So the, old, the elders of the village take him where he was from. And then he says, I remember being murdered, and this is where my body is. They dug up. And there's a body. He says, you know, I was killed by an axe, and the skull was was hit with an axe. And he says, well, this is where the murder weapon is buried. They dig up, and there's a murder weapon. So then he goes, oh, by the way, the kid has a birthmark right where the skull was hit in the in his past life. Wow. So in his new body has a birthmark in his old body. He has the, the uh, where the axe was hit. Then, on top of that, he says, this is where the murderer lives, and his name is this, um, this and that. And they go and they confront him, and they tell him, you know, this boy is accusing you, and here's a body, and here's a murder weapon, and, and the guy kind of freaked out, and then, you know, finally um, confessed to the murder. And the murder happened four years ago. Wow. And this kid's three? And this kid's three. It's like you can't even make this kind of stuff up. Wow. wow. For me, uh, you know, for me, that's definitely proof. But that's one story um, 
some of you probably heard it because yeah, a lot of people have been talking about that one. Um, okay, so now we're going to move into something different. Um, here we have squeezable homemade toothpaste. Now, I've messed around, like, making this stuff, and, um, you know, it's kind of sloppy to make, so it's a bit of a pain in the neck. But here's one that is... Um, Seems kind of easy. I don't know if I can get the things, but five tablespoons of calcium powder or calcium magnesium powder, uh, three tablespoons of I can't pronounce this xylitol powder. You um, did well with that, Ramon. Thank you. Uh, four tablespoons of coconut oil. I've been taking English classes. Um, <laughs> oh, gee. don't tablespoon. you mean teaching? Uh, same thing. Oh. One tablespoon uh, of baking soda. Two tablespoons of bit, bentonite clay, uh, three tablespoons of distilled water, and um, forty plus drops of essential oils, and optional twenty to thirty drops of trace minerals. So this is all just for making toothpaste, right? Yep. So, you what's wrong with own. good old baking soda? The bowl, but this is squeezable, right? Yeah, this is combining everything together. Hmm. So everything there I've heard is really good. So they is just combining everything together to make us interesting. You know, um, I, I, it, uh, you know, we used to make our own. Well, I'm 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 still I'm actually getting ready to make another batch of laundry detergent, and uh, you know, making my own soaps is is uh, you know I don't do I haven't done the bar soaps myself yet, but doing the laundry detergent is really simple. Um, so uh, how is it? Uh, you, you just use some, uh, Fels naphtha, uh, oh geez, I don't have the recipe in front of me. Fels naphtha and water and I can't remember everything else. Baking soda? Uh, baking soda, yeah. Hmm. Baking soda goes in everything good. Yeah, it seems <laughs> like it. Um, here's another one, an unexpected giant exoplanet discovered. Um, I just find it amazing how many exoplanets we're discovering more and more. Yeah, but this one's a little unique, though, Ramon. This one, is, they were actually able to get a visual sight on it, uh, which is pretty unusual for the planets that they've been discovering. Most of them have been radio telescope or in one of the other uh, spectrums that they've been able to detect them in. Uh, this one has a, a tremendous, tremendous orbit around its planet. Uh, I can't remember. I read this article yesterday. Uh, you have it in front of you? Yeah, I'm looking at it right now. Yeah, what's, what's it say, like 100 and, or 13,000 years? years. Or 13,000 years rotation? Oh, that's uh, Neptune. It takes the planet 80,000 Earth years to complete one full revolution. Wow, Neptune isn't that something? Takes just yeah, ne Neptune takes 165 years, but yeah. this, wow, it's it's one hell of so a long summer. That has that's that's <laughs> definitely something to say for the uh, good old mirror telescopes that we're using and gazing out there in the stars with. Yeah, yeah, so. uh, it's it's quite amazing. Here's another one that um, kind of blew my mind. Hold on, I'm getting commercials. Here. Um, this one is basically, um, I hate when you get those little commercial things blocking what you're trying to read. Um, this video, uh, it's a solar roadway, and it's basically, to make a long story short, it's these panels that are about one, it seems like a two, about two feet, a square, two square feet, each panel, and you put them on the road, and it's made from glass. And it can absorb um, the sun, you know, to make electricity, solar panels. And not only that, they have, like, these little digital lights on them. So you can change the road to whatever you want, you know. Uh, for example, it, could, it has sensors on it. If there's an animal crossing, it can sense it and let you know far away. It also has a side, way, uh, a side area where you can run all the electric lines from there and no longer you have to put them on top. Um, the other amaze, it also ha has like a gutter thing and it was invented by this couple that they've um, 
known each other since they were three. Yeah, that's just but, something that you know. I looked at that story too, and I mean, it's a neat idea, and I mean, maybe way, way down the road for us, you know. But to produce these things in in enough quantity to you know make a mile long road, you're talking a lot of panels. I mean, that's a that's a <laughs> a uh, yeah, maybe way down the road, but I think some other technology will come along before that comes into play. Although their their solar panels do look pretty intriguing to me. I mean, you know, I like solar, and yeah, you know, I've the, got my uh, own panels. And well, the thing I liked about this is if one is damaged, you can take one out and replace it. Right. Um, unlike if you have one cracked road, you have to. It, it will take so much time. So I think initially it would be a problem. I was looking at the negative part of this and looking up what some people were saying, how this would never happen. And they were saying because it's too costly. Um, they never, actually the website does never say how much each one costs. But I think if you combine what sewers, um, electric lines, and road maintenance costs, it might add up to the same amount or less. Mm -hmm. And this is producing something, so... Yeah, yeah. We'll see. I, uh, um, like I said, I, I don't see it as being a, a real feasible technology where they're at right now, but because uh, I think there's something else will come along the road before they, before we we see a real need for that in our world today. Anyways, then again, it, it, twenty years later, we might be still, you know, in this. In this right. Anyway. Right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so. Here's a, another one. You know how much I, I love, and I'll cut it off at, at this one. Um, you know how much I love when I when I see young kids doing amazing things. And this nine year old um, built a non for profit no kill animal shelter out of his garage to help stray animals. And the reason why this story is so amazing is because this is a nine year old child who's putting this stuff together. Um, Ken. Nine has grown up dreaming about someday having a shelter to help the stray animals that live near his home, but he never dreamed he could reach his goal so soon. Ken did his best to help the local stray dogs and cats he came across near his home in the Philippines. He frequently spent time with them and offered them food, but he longed for the funds to open a no-kill shelter where he could really help his furry friends according to the happy animal club website so i'll leave it at that but i just love when i see these news of these young kids so, so he's named it the happy animal club um it doesn't really say this is according to the happy animal club website so i, I think, think that's an they're... awesome name though <laughs> I, I don't think they're related though hmm uh, who knows? Anyway, so anyway. we have an amazing guest, and I think he fell asleep. Uh, us <laughs> jibber jabbing over here. Oh, maybe so. It's pretty late where he's at tonight. We've got a special treat for you. Besides the fact that this is our two hundredth show, yes, uh, that's right. Uh, we're stepping off into a field that we have not touched on yet. Out of those two hundred plus shows that we've done, uh, we've got Peter Field. Peter Field is one of the leading hypnotherapists working in the UK today, having spent much of his professional life abroad and gaining experience and expertise in the Far East and North America. Peter returned to the UK 10 years ago and quickly established himself in the field of hypnopsychotherapy. With more than 30 years of international hypnosis experience, he is an acknowledged master in the healing art of hypnopsychotherapy, known as the therapist therapist. Peter's clients are drawn from all over the UK as well as overseas and include psych psychiatrists, psychologists, doctors, and other hypnotherapists, as well as celebrities from the world of entertainment and sports. In addition to his busy hypnopsychotherapy practice in London and Birmingham, Peter is an author, lecturer, broadcaster, and a regular BBC com contributor, Huffington Post and Psych Central writer, and internationally recognized writer on psychotherapy. Uh, hypnosis and health. His expertise has been featured in the Times and other prestigious journals. He's appeared on TV and radio, and his knowledgeable articles are currently published internationally on more than 
200 different websites. Peter is also a board-certified hypnotherapist and certified instructor in the National Guild of Hip Hypnotherapists and delivers advanced hypnotherapy training to therapists internationally. The NGH is one of the largest and oldest professional hypnosis organizations in the world. He's got our new book out called The Chi of Change, and I want to welcome Peter Field to the 100th Monkey Radio. Thank you, Tom. What a build-up. I feel humbled by my own publicity. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well... Peter, I, I mentioned that this is uh, that uh, this is an area that we haven't delved into yet, and you know, I don't know if you had a chance to look at some of our past guests or or the types of things that we've been into in the past, but we do not have a single hyp hypnotherapist of any way, shape, or form that we have interviewed yet. So I, I felt it, especially for our two hundred show, it was about time that we did something along those lines. Uh, so, Peter. Uh, a little bit of background on you. I mean, uh, your bio covered a little bit there, but uh, I always like to find out from our guests, what was it about the profession that you chose that sparked your interest there? Well, I started off by studying uh, psychology, Tom, but how did I get into psychology? Well, as, as a young man, I was pretty lost. I, um, in fact, totally lost. I uh, <laughs> drinking. Join the uh, club. Oh, yeah, you know the story. Alcoholic, uh, drug addicted, uh, homeless, you name it, I was, I was down and out. And uh, I, was, I was pretty close to, to the end there. And then the doctors had given up hope on me. And um, in fact, I, 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 hospitals refused to accept me anymore. <laughs> I've been in all the drying out clinics. And the, the story was basically, I, I got down to about um, 98 pounds in weight and I'm six feet tall. So I was really just a bag of bones. And... I found myself um, going to the final doctor who said, basically, get out of here. The only way you're going to live is if you stop drugging and drinking and you get your life back together again. You don't have months to do this. You have weeks. So what do you do if you're alcoholic and uh, you know, misusing the drugs? Well, you go out and get a half a bottle of, uh, of rum, white rum, and you, you take a few swigs of it, which is what I did. I went back to the, the place I was uh, staying in and uh, I collapsed. I collapsed on the floor, as a, one of those hard, cold uh, tile floors, and then I didn't have the energy to get up. And a thought hit me, as if a voice was calling out to me saying, what do you want? Do you want to call it a day now because you're there? Or do you want to live? But make up your mind now because no more chances. And I believe the voice was coming from somewhere deep within me, a wiser part of myself. And in that moment, I understood something. I understood that I didn't want to die. I did want to live. And I knew that then the only way I was going to live is if I took responsibility for climbing back up out of that big, dark pit I was in. And that decision to take responsibility um, was what turned my life around. I did turn my life around. I haven't taken uh, any, any alcohol or, or, or um, done any kind of um, substance. Since that time, and this is in my 20s, uh, many, many uh, moons ago, and then I found myself wanting to, to share something of my journey. So I studied psychology, and I found myself also in, uh, in France on, on my journeys, travels, and I was going to 12-step groups, uh, Alcoholics Anonymous and so on, and part of the 12-step uh, ethos is you, you also help people who are still caught up in, in the alcohol abuse and, and, and drug abuse so i found myself going into hospitals talking to people who were there because they'd abused themselves with alcohol or drugs and i also went into prisons like Le Bomet, which is maximum security prison in marseille and talking to people not about what got them into the prison one by one but what got me into the situation that I got into with the alcohol and the drugs and what got me out. And people were relating to that. And I was able to very fortunately relate to them and, and, and to help them. And I saw transformation beginning to happen. So I, I, I knew there was a possibility to use the experiences of my past. And I knew then what I know now, what I do, we do believe is that absolutely nothing that we ever pass through or experience can ever really be wasted. Nothing is ever 
ever lost or wasted. Even if we don't understand it at that time, whatever we pass through can be very, very useful and productive. So I took these things and I studied them, found myself in India, I studied hypnosis, and, and, and that's basically how I, how I got into the helping, helping professions, if we can call it that. Mm. <laughs> Bit of a long story for you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. it's good stuff. Uh, so I'm I'm curious, you know, what what was the, um, the there's a motivation behind or or something that you you know that instant gratification in Western society and in our world today that you know we we always we like to have something that we we receive while while we're doing something and I, and in my experience has been it, it it that's borne out to be quite true that there's there's almost always something that we're gaining back from what are the actions that we take. And I'm curious of what you felt you were gaining as you were going out into these hospitals and these prisons and stuff. Oh, absolutely. And I always prefaced my, 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 my talks or my discussions with people. Please do me a favor of listening to me. I'm really here asking you to help me by listening to me. I'm here for myself as part of my recovery. Would you do me the honor of just listening to me? And that seemed to be a wonderful way. And of course, what, what I was doing and what I'm still doing, what every human being does, is there such a thing as altruism? Is there any such thing as real selflessness? Well, perhaps yes, but perhaps that's, that's debatable. I was helping myself through helping others. Hmm. As an alcoholic, as a drug addicted person, as a homeless person, my life had absolutely no meaning and no purpose. And that's a common denominator I felt with people who have allowed themselves to, to enter in the disease model of, of alcoholism is they lack a sense of meaning in, in existence, in, in purpose in life. And so this is how I develop my, my purpose and my meaning. And this is how I uh, kind of function today, basically. It's part of who I am, what I do, and, and how, I, how I stay alive on the planet. Hmm. Yeah, you know, uh, go ahead, Ramon. Okay. I was going to say, that really changes everything when you approach it that way because I think the most people will drop their guards right away because it's not about them, it's about you. Yeah. Where most people would, you know, if you go, why do you do this, why do you do that, they get defensive. And it's like, you don't know me, you don't know what I've been through. So approaching it that way is, is very amazing. Exactly. People relate to, to my story in, in those situations. And I still use I still use my story as part of the therapy I, 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 uh, I, I employ and conduct. Uh, of course, I'm talking about the client because of their for their issues. But I always put some kind of sharing of, of what I've been through, because something I say will somehow connect or relate with what they're going through. I, I, I don't have the arrogance to, 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 to suggest that I understand what they've been through on another person's journey. Of course, no one can understand fully anyone else's journey, but usually something that I say will connect with what that person's been through. Once that connection's made, we've got an alliance. And with that alliance, it is a therapeutic alliance which allows us to somehow uh, move forward in, 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 in trust. Mm, right. I, that's that's a huge aspect of your work, isn't it? Gaining the trust of those that you're working with. That's right, Tom. Without trust, I think very little is possible. If trust is not established very early on in the therapeutic alliance, alliance then it's very, very difficult, if not impossible, to, to really uh, move forward or progress or bring any transformational change into, into anyone's life. Yeah. Right. Well, what I found a lot in the medical field, uh, including psychiatry, and psychology is that most people feel like just uh, another number. Yes. You so know, true. Yeah. It's like, okay, your 45 minutes is up. Time to move on. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. And it can sometimes be expensive uh, uh, therapy, expensive silence, just to have someone uh, remain silent. I had a, I had a, a fellow in about, well, about a month ago who um, he made his first appointment with me. And he said, I've made an appointment with a psychiatrist and the, the appointment's coming up in two days' time. Should I keep the, the appointment with the psychiatrist? And I said, well, of course. You, know, you have the appointment. Who am I to say, don't do it? You go along and, uh, and see what, uh, you know, what the person's going to say to you. And uh, he came back in and uh, a bit kind of um, disillusioned. I asked him, well, how did you get on with your, your uh, psychiatrist? He said, well, you sat there looking bored. At the end of the discussion, uh, which I did all talking, he just reached for his prescription pad and wrote me out a prescription for the telephone. <laughs> wow. <laughs> and this, unfortunately, is, is what's happening 
so often. I'd say a, at least a third of the people coming to see me have been put on these prescription antidepressant drugs. Uh, doctor, I'm feeling blue, I'm feeling down, I'm feeling upset. Here is an antidepressant. Doctor, I have erectile dysfunction problems. Oh, here is an antidepressant. They're being prescribed like, like candy and uh, it's not really, I think, the best way forward if we have emotional difficulties to be giving uh, pill-sized therapy or pill-shaped therapy. It doesn't seem to be the way forward. Well, you know, yeah. that, it, that doesn't seem like therapy at all to me. It's just masking the symptoms. Yes, exactly, Tom. And that's, that's, that's precisely my take on it. But we're living in a society where, in the States, for example, 10% of the population over the age of 12 is on prescription antidepressant pharmaceutical drugs right now. 10% of the American population over the age of 12 will be taking antidepressants. And what are they doing? They're attempting to stifle the feelings or the emotions which are uncomfortable, they don't want to deal with, people don't want to deal with by trying to drug them into oblivion. Rather than listen to uh, the messages being conv conveyed by those emotions and saying, what are these messages trying to tell me? Where are they coming from? And what can I do about it? In other words, instead of just masking the symptoms or trying to bludgeon them or, or um, hammer them away, we should be asking, what's creating those symptoms? Let's go to the cause of those symptoms and let's do something about the cause, not just try to mask the symptoms. Mm, exactly. We, ju we just laid out one of the biggest problems in our world today is is the masking of the symptom and not addressing the core the cause or the core um i mean we see we we see that in uh the the regular medical world too i mean where uh they the the drugs that they give people for all sorts of different maladies uh end up being uh just something that masks the symptoms and doesn't really address what the the root cause of the of the disease, disease is. I like yes. that. I like the the play on that word, the disease versus disease. Yes, um, that's but, right. You know, of course. Oh, the, go ahead. Sorry, sorry, Rama. Yeah, absolutely true. Disease, and that's where the, the word come from, <coughs> came from, isn't it? It did come from these two words, disease. <coughs> Excuse right. me a second. But this is the problem, isn't it, Tom and, and Rama too? We've, we're living in a world, a society now, which, which has a tendency to medicalize human emotion and, and difficulties. The dis-ease, the uncomfortable feelings generated by the, the feeling part of the mind, the subconscious mind, are now being treated as, as, as illnesses. For example, the, the Bible, so to speak, of uh, the psychiatric world is, is something called the um, diagnostic, uh, diagnostic Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders, the DSM. And uh, the, the most recent version of this was, was produced last, uh, last uh, December. And in this, there's a, a condition, for example, let me give you an example, called ODD, which is called Oppositional Defiant Disorder. Now, what is Oppositional Defiant Disorder? It's a mental disorder. If a child or a teenager disobeys the orders or requests of an adult, or unduly questions an adult, or is disruptive in their conversation with an adult, they can be now diagnosed with wow. ODD. Now, doesn't it sound That's to you every like... every single child. <laughs> yes, exactly. A typical kid, a typical teenager, but now it is in the DSM, the Diagnostic Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders. So we are medicalizing which are aspects of humanity which are perfectly normal. We're giving them names and labels because then we can prescribe drugs and we can try to manipulate or control uh, people and their emotions. Wow. wow. Scary. Yeah, saw... it is scary. But, you know, on, on the other hand, we have this fantastic thing, uh, the Internet, and there's so much information out there and there's so many people that are waking up to just those facts that, yes. that, that, you know, what the system that we have in place right now, there are problems with and, uh, that there, we need to get back to the human part of this equation and get rid of the, the labeling and the numbers, you know, uh, yes. you know, I, every one of us here in the U S has a social security number. You know, that's, mm. that's our number for, you know, tracking. Uh, you know, we need to get away from those numbers and back to, you know, we're people. 
we are humans. We have the full range of of experience as humans. Uh, you know the and every and all the baggage that goes along with it. Uh, you know the depressions, the elations, the you know the full range of of emotions and and dramas that w- that we experience as humans. Uh, yeah, and and this this voice out in the wilderness of so many people that are stepping up to the plate now and saying, no, this is wrong. There's mm-hmm. better ways to do this. And hence, we have people like you that are coming up to the plate now. And uh, so kudos on that. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. I, I also found that they're now doing um, drugging uh, uh, toddlers. Yes. Under yes. the age of three, you know. That's right. Once the three on, yeah. The, um, yeah. the age of three on now, um, clinical uh, depression is labeled being applied to children as young as three, and they are being given medication for, for the clinical depression. This, this word clinical is rather interesting, isn't it? Because that suggests that there's something almost austere or antiseptic about it. Uh, I, uh, there's a, such a thing as clinical hypnotherapy. Well, I, 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 I refuse to use this term because I'm not a clinician. I don't do laboratory tests. Uh, I am a human being helping other human beings. I like what Baba Ram Dass said about that. He said, we're all just walking each other home. Mm. And basically, that's my take. That's my take. And that's what I'm doing. I'm helping people to get home to themselves. I'm walking people home. I'm not a clinician. I don't put people under under um, microscopes or take blood samples or stool samples. Just help. It's a person helping people. And that's my approach to the work I do, too. Hmm. Yeah, here's a, another thing that, um, especially in the um, news media, like in America, you have these um, horrible gun violences where hmm. people go in and, and shoot up, you know, a whole area. Hmm. And they all have something in common, which is, you know, the only thing they'll focus is on, ah, we need gun, you know, more uh, uh, gun, gun control. protection, gun control, gun control. But then you go on the other side of the world, like a place like Japan, and um, about a month ago I was telling Tom there was a stabbing in a city not too far from me where a guy just went nuts and, and stabbed four people and, you know, injured several. And, you know, then you have, you go to China and you had a guy go into a school the same day that, have, uh, that the one in Connecticut went in and stabbed 20 children. You never heard them talk about that in the news, but they all had one thing in common is that every single one of those people had mental issues. Yeah, and we're, so, we're on some sort of psycho, psycho, psychotropic drug or some kind. Exactly. And not only that, but here's two countries where guns are completely illegal. Carrying any type of knife in both, uh, both in Japan and China is illegal. They will throw you in jail for it tiny small little knife um and Mm. yet you get these violences you know these acts of violence so how do you look at at, at that as the way we're approaching the violence when most of these gentlemen are on some type of drug well they don't necessarily need to be on drugs i mean there is possible i mean it would be foolish to deny the fact that there is such a thing possible as mental illness there is a possibility of mental illness when the the brain chemistry is so disordered the neurological system is so out of sync that reality becomes distorted this is this is entirely the case you've always had this you've had this in every society whether the guns or knives or clubs you'll always find a certain uh, percentage of the people that will have this imbalance. We don't know why. Is it genetic? Is it a combination of, of genes and also uh, the, the genes being activated or triggered by environmental cues? We, we really don't know this yet. But um, what we do know is that people who have access to uh, weapons, firearms especially, perhaps are more likely to be using those things than someone who take a knife and and then go and do it. It's got to be harder to stick a knife into someone, hasn't it, than it has to pull a trigger on someone. In the UK, we used to have um, capital punishment hanging, and there were two uh, criteria as to whether or not someone would end up at the end of a rope if they killed somebody else. And this was a criteria. Was it premeditated? If a gun was used... 
you would swing because you had to plan to get a gun before if you used a knife you get life in prison that was simple as that uh, so guns perhaps a little easier to uh, to pull a trigger than it is to take a knife and to put put it into someone's uh, stomach or, or stab people, even if it's a school of people, I guess it's harder. But you'll always find people who are who are going to be so disturbed as to, as, as to be doing that, and it's it's very difficult to get a purchase on that. Yeah, you know, one of the problems with all of that is that uh, most of these people were in the uh, the system in some form or fashion of oh, yeah. medical care, psychological care. Yeah. And uh, they were treated as that number. And, you know, mm. the, the, the issues weren't talked about, uh, you know, in a holistic <laughs> manner or a healthy manner, uh, in, in, at least in my opinion. And they were they were just addressed with prescriptions. Yes. So, yeah. Yeah. so that's yeah. why that's why I really like your approach. I really oh. like your approach. Interesting. Uh, yeah. Yeah, I have two chapters, uh, Tom and Ron, and, and my book on, on depression, for example. One is the medical uh, response to depression, and the other one is a, is an alternative pre approach, the one I the one I take. And as the as a preface to the medical approach, uh, I quote Amy Winehouse. And Amy Weiss, Winehouse, the quote is, since the age of 16, I've been taking antidepressants. Uh, Amy Winehouse, you know, of course. Right. Uh, uh, passed she, away. Yeah, passed away. Uh, so the antidepressants didn't really do a lot of good for her. So there are people just absolutely on chemical uh, substances uh, that are just not really receiving the treatment that they, they do need. And they, yeah, yeah. It's so, hard to uh, get yeah. a system whereby you can, you can uh, address that. Uh, right. Well, when before, it, before we dig too deep into the book... Uh, I have one question. Why the where where'd the title come from? The Chi of Change. Oh, yes. Okay. Yeah. Chi, of course, comes from the Taoist uh, concept of energy. Uh, uh, Raman knows it, knows it probably in in um, in Japan as Ki. In uh, in India, it's, it's known as uh, Shakti or Prana, depending which which part of India you, you come from. Uh, I use it as a metaphor, basically. We know in the Taoist tradition, uh, Chi is is energy, basically, and I use it a metaphor, as a metaphor for feelings or emotion. Uh, the conscious mind, that part we're largely talking with now, deals with logic. It's very rational. Uh, it thinks. I call the conscious mind the thinking mind. The subconscious mind, I call it the feeling mind, because it doesn't care too much about thinking. It cares a lot about feeling. Its language is, is imagination. And so the subconscious mind is, is the feeling mind, and that's... Uh, the part of us which controls a lot of our um, behavior. The feelings uh, which bring people to the, the therapist and which the system would so readily drug are the difficult or the awkward feelings, the uncomfortable feelings. And those feelings are basically coming from the subconscious mind, being generated by the powerful part of the subconscious mind. They are a form of energy. They're sending a message to the, the person saying, well, let, look, I'm not feeling comfortable. I won't let you feel comfortable until you fix this. So that energy is basically information, which is what qi is. Qi is, uh, in Chinese tradition, it is energy and it is information. We know those two things are uh, basically what the whole universe is, is based on. All matter is a combination of energy and information. That's according to <laughs> physics, of course, energy and information. So I use qi uh, as the... Um, as a metaphor basically for feelings the feelings are energy uh and information being sent from the subconscious mind asking us to act on on, on this information hmm. that's basically g <laughs> there you there you go uh okay so oh wow where do we go with this um you know there's there's uh... I, I suppose what is let's let's go here. Let, what is hypnotherapy for those who may not understand exactly what hypnotherapy is? That's a good question. Yeah. Well, I guess to understand hypnotherapy, we have to understand what hypnosis is, Tom. And hypnosis is basically there's so much nonsense being broadcast about hypnosis, about the hypnotist controlling the person. Nothing can really be farther from the truth. Hypnosis is not about controlling someone. It's about helping someone to control their own mind and emotions. So I see hypnosis basically it's a state where we, we change our, our usual focus. Uh, we can move beyond the limitations of our conscious mind 
and we can access the deeper mind or the subconscious part. And in, in this state, we can accept helpful suggestions. We can we can tap into resources that are not usually available to us in our general conscious alert state. Now, hypnotherapy is the use of this state, the use of hypnosis for uh, therapeutic purposes. It's use of hypnosis for self-improvement, for, for resolution of, of emotional difficulties, issues. And it's also uh, very effective uh, in the use of uh, management of pain. Mm. Is it too, yeah. That's basically what hypnotherapy is. Hmm. So um, now I, I'm curious, uh, are we able to do this without, uh, you know, can, can we access these things ourselves without having to, you know, go through some, some process through hypnotherapy or how do, how do, do we, are, do we have the ability to uh, change these things within ourselves without having, you know, uh, you know, making an appointment and going to, you know, blank, blank. Yeah, sure. Well, a lot can be done um, in auto-hypnosis, self-hypnosis, basically. Um, a person can, can learn self-hypnosis. They don't necessarily need to go to a, a hypnotherapist or a hypnotist to do this. And many things can be accomplished there. But certain aspects of the therapy is very difficult to do on oneself. Hmm. For example, um, a good part of my work consists of regression therapy um, taking people back to the origin of the problem and often this will happen before the age of five or six and it's very difficult for the person to go back in the state of hypnosis to that particular incident and it's what I call the original incident which has caused the problem um, which brings people to a therapist I call it the ISE or the initial sensitizing event it's the basic conditioning now if we don't access the actual beginning of the problem then we will access maybe uh, a continuation of the problem but that won't resolve might bring a certain amount of relief for a certain period of time but unless we know how to access the origin of the problem when the seeds planted the conditioning experience and then do something about that experience reinterpret or reprocess that experience so it no longer has the impact on the subconscious feeling mind that it does then it's very difficult to remove the problem so that kind of thing uh, it, it's kind of hard, but self hypnosis certainly can uh, can uh, accelerate the process, and a lot can be accomplished through that uh, process as well. Mm. Yeah, I can definitely see how how if you're not uh, you're not able to get to the the source or the root cause, then you're doing the same thing Western science does is bas basically just masking the symptoms. <laughs> Absolutely, <laughs> yes, that's right. Yeah. You know, this thing called hypnosis, Tom, we we actually experience it on a daily basis. Uh, we just don't call it hypnosis. Uh, if you've ever, and I'm sure you have, um, driven your car along the freeway, along the highway, and you, you've missed your exit, you, um, you're in a state of um, highway hypnosis there. You weren't asleep, you were, you were aware, but you were kind of in that daydreamy state. That's a trance state. You know, when you, you sometimes maybe you've gone on a computer um, and what seemed like uh, 10 minutes was an hour. Well, that's because you're in a trance state in front of the computer. Um, so it's something which is totally natural. Um, it's, it's a state which exists since the beginning of the dawn of time of, uh, of man's uh, uh, walking on, on the planet here. The first person who stared into a fire and went off and drifted off in a daydream that person was in a trance so it's something very natural for human beings to uh, to to enter the state of hypnosis but hypnotherapy is where we do things strategically therapeutically in that particular uh, state so it's kind of guided hypnosis for therapeutic purposes right you know i suppose each case is uh unique within itself but uh I, I'm I'm assuming that there's some basic outlines that you use for uh, diagnosis for you know finding that source and finding that yes. root cause. Yes, absolutely. Now, where is what's popular in the UK today, and then also in in the states, is something called cognitive behavioral therapy. Now, cognitive behavioral therapy is a is a strategy used by psychotherapists and psychologists to help a person control the thoughts, the thinking in their minds. I have studied it, and it's not the, the uh, modality or the therapy I use. I don't go through the thinking process. I go through the feeling process. So someone comes to me, let's say they're experiencing panic attacks or anxiety. I'll ask them to close their eyes and tell me how they do that, how they feel. 
And so people will originally say, well, uh, I feel confused. Well, how does confused feel? Well, I feel like I don't know whether I'm coming or going. Well, how does that feel? And we get down into the actual gut feeling. Well, my heart's beating rapidly. Uh, it feels like my stomach's got butterflies in it. My shoulders are tense. I've got pins and needles in my hands, whatever it is. Now, in hypnosis, we can ride back on those feelings. In a deep, deep state of hypnosis, we can bring up the feelings make them re-experience the feelings, and then ride back as a surfer might ride back on the crest of a wave to a previous time when those feelings were there. Not the thoughts, but the feelings. And we keep doing that and going back until we go to the origin. Hmm. When we go to the origin, we stop the process. Because then we know what we're dealing with. We know the experience that's caused this. And quite often, it's what maybe the adult mind or the grown-up mind might think is pretty insignificant laughable but for a child it can be massive right it's all about perception it's not about the actual fact or the experience it's what we do with the experience how we perceive and that perception comes back as a blueprint or as a piece of programming if we can use a computer analogy a programming in the in the biocomputer of the subconscious mind which tells us about reality our place in the world what we can expect from life, how we relate to other people, how we relate to ourselves, is all governed by those kind of experiences that we've got encoded in the in the memory banks of the subconscious mind. Right, right. So, so yeah. Yeah. So I, I was just thinking of, of uh, uh, a, you know, going, you know, applying that same thing into, like, habits. Yeah. Uh, I, I'm... I'm not really sure how that would apply and that that format would apply and to say uh smoking yeah or would yeah. you approach that differently but differently yes habits are a little different habits just basically are repetitive behavioral patterns so what's happened is that through repetition, the subconscious mind loves repetition. That's how we acquire habits and, and addictions. By going through a process of repetition, we create neural pathways, just like a pathway through the woods by going backwards and forwards. We're going to wear a pathway through that woods or, or the field. So by going through a, a behavior or a ritualistic or a, a pattern of behavior, we create links between neurons and we create chains. So those chains then trigger habits. Now, with hypnosis, we don't necessarily have to look for the origin of that habit. We could do, but it's not really necessary. All we have to do is to focus on behavioral modification. And we can do that through suggestion therapy, because in, in, in hypnosis, the subconscious mind will accept suggestions. For example, if I see myself as a, uh, as a smoker, as you mentioned, or a, a nail biter, it's part of my identity. My subconscious mind believes that's who I am. My name's Peter and I'm a smoker. As soon as the mind accepts the belief that my name's Peter and I'm not a smoker, my name's Peter but I'm an apple eater and I'm an apple eater, then it'll simply reorganize the belief system and the programming will change and I will no longer have to have that habit. Does that make some kind of sense? Mm. There? Yeah, it does. It does. Uh, you know, I'm I'm actually... Uh, somewhat familiar with that process. Um, yes. Uh, yeah. Ramon, you got something right now? Yeah. Do you find when you when you help someone through one of their, let's say, someone who has a very low self esteem, or they, um, uh, what else? You know, <laughs> those kind of issues that you were covering. Yeah. Do you find yeah. that they become more psychic? It depends on the person, really. I mean, you know, um, it depends how open they are to to the universe. Basically, how close how close that the paradigm is. Uh, it, it can happen, uh, but not necessarily not necessarily, not necessarily so. We, what I do find is that people become more less afraid of their feelings. So many people are afraid of their feelings. So they're afraid of things which are not tangible, but emotions scare them. So the psychic kind of quality you're mentioning, I think you're mentioning, uh, some people will be afraid of that because it's not something transitional, it's not something they can hold on to or hang on to, and it's above all, it's the unknown. Mm. It's, it, it's, it's been said, 
that by spiritual teachers, and perhaps you've heard this, there are only two basic human emotions anyway. Everything is a derivative of these two essential human emotions. One of them is love, and the other one is fear. Right. And from fear comes lack of self-confidence. I'm afraid this will happen. Comes anxiety. What if this happens? What if I can't do this? What if comes panic? Everything, everyone coming to see me certainly brings with them fear. They don't come in and say, I'm here because I'm afraid. Well, a phobic person might do. I'm here because I'm afraid of elevators or from uh, leaving the house or from taking airplanes. But apart from phobic people, almost no one comes in and says, I'm here because I'm afraid. The people have low self-confidence, low self-esteem. They're afraid. They're, they're, they're functioning on a fear base, on a fear base. Uh, people who, who come in for almost everything else, it's fear that they're bringing themselves in with. So I think perhaps that... Once a person becomes closer to themselves, let say walking them back home to themselves, when the person becomes closer to this authentic self or, or selves, then they will perhaps become more open to looking at or at least considering uh, things which are not tangible or transitional that they can hold on to. So possibly they'll be more open to the psychic phenomena that you may be referring to, Ramon. Hmm. That covered yeah. for you, Ramon? Yeah. I was going to say that I find with the um the fear base uh, a lot of really holds people back from doing anything um mm. for example if you're a person you hate your job and you want to move into like uh doing your own business that a lot of people they stop right there because of the fear yes Yes. And it, it, it motivates a lot of people, doesn't it, Ramon? I mean, the fear is, is what exactly what pe motivates people to stay in jobs that they dislike, to stay in relationships, which are, are really uh, damaging, to stay in all kinds of situations, to stay stuck fear because they're afraid of reaching out. This they know. Depression is a form of fear in some ways. Um, I'm afraid if I get up, I'll fall down. So let me stay on the floor because I can't fall off the floor. Hmm. <laughs> so that's what happens there. Yeah. You know, I had, a, I had a, a, a young boy come to see me. Well, he didn't come to see me so much as uh, he was brought to see me uh, by his father about uh, three weeks or so ago. And a young, young fella about uh, 14, 15 years old and uh, suffering from chronic and acute um, agoraphobia. He, he couldn't leave the, the home. He hadn't been out of the home for over two months. He hadn't been to school. He couldn't leave the home. The only way he got in to see me was his father wrestled him into the car to get his mother, locked the doors and drove off. And uh, I knew nothing about that. I had no idea how bad it was. And so I get this mobile telephone call saying, please come down to the parking lot. He won't get out of the car. I go down there and uh, he'll allow me in the car. And the, the, the poor kid is quivering with fear it's it's like an animal this is terrified he couldn't leave the car well three times i went up and came down again after three times he decided to trust me enough to come back up he came back up i had to take off i work in a suit and tie it's just the persona which people respect over here in the uk so i had to take off my my uh, jacket and my tie to talk to the boy brought him up there would you believe me, within two sessions, that boy was back at school. Nice. Wow. And he was he was absolutely fine. He's doing really well. In fact, his father came into therapy with me. This would be considered one of the top three most difficult um, psychiatric disorders to deal with. It's it's the only phobia which is treated as a, as actually as a, a medical uh, issue, and they'll they'll drug it. The other phobias they won't drug it usually, and they might get tranquilizers to fear of flying or claustrophobic people. But agoraphobia is, is really tough. Hmm. He, he, was, he was going out with friends to McDonald's and so on and so forth. What did it What did it take to shift the guy? Was yeah. to understand what fear is. If I'd never been afraid, I wouldn't have been able to reach that person. So I used exactly inside the car to get him to come to my office the same strategy I used in the prison and the hospitals. I say, you're afraid, and I know what it is to be afraid because I've been afraid, just like you. And I've been shaking just like you. And when you listen to my story, because here's what happened to me in my fear. 
Hmm. And he just related to it. And that was the that was the trust. That was the therapeutic alliance, alliance was established right up after three times. It comes up into the office and we can get down to business. Fear is probably the worst motivator, isn't it, Ramon, for any, anyone to do anything. But it's one which governs so many, many people. Hmm. I'm curious, you know, did, did you find a, the root of his yes. fear? Yes, yes. It, yes. Uh, in, his, in his case, it was two, two things. He'd not himself been bullied at school, <clears throat> which I'd surmised maybe had been the case. <clears throat> but he has observed somebody else being bullied. He'd gone to a new school at the age of 11, and he'd witnessed somebody else being beaten up by a bully. And he also came from a home where his father was extremely demanding. The kind of father that uh, the boy brings back uh, 90%, and uh, the father says, um, not well done, son, but what happened to the other 10% here, or 95%? Right. Where's that 5%? So the pressure was, was enormous on this boy. Right. And it kind of imploded. The bullying incident was a, a subsequent sensitizing event, which was built on the the uh, initial sensitizing event of the fear of the father, disappointing the father, and, and fear was there. That's what basically it was. And you did all this without drugs? Exactly. Absolutely amazing. Fantastic. Fantastic. And, you know, Tom, the, the wonderful, I'm in such a privileged position to be doing this work. I see miracles unfolding before my eyes. And after all these years, after all these years, I am still amazed. Hmm. I see. And it's such a such an honor and a privilege to be doing this work. Yeah. Well, so we're at the top of the hour already, if you can believe that. It just flew oh. by. Uh, where can people pick up your book at? Well, Amazon.com. Uh, there's also my website, which is um, www. So in the morning, Chi of Change, C H I of Change, Chi of Change dot com. And by the way, I'm offering lots of uh, uh, wonderful uh, bonus uh, uh, gifts uh, for people who, who, who will also order the book. I have another book written called uh, A Sense of Joy: Reflections of a Psychotherapist, which they're getting. We get downloads of uh, of two of my uh, self hypnosis CDs together with the book. And nice. The book is going to be released at the end of May, and uh, chiefofchange dot com is 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 the website to look. Well, fantastic! And also, we have links all the, on all that on our website on the show page for this. And so, if you're listening in one of those other media's besides on our site, the YouTube's, the Vimos, the uh, iTunes, or wherever you happen to be tuning in at. Uh, you can pop over to www.100thmonkeyradio.com and find this show in the archives. So, <clears throat> excuse me. All right, I want to thank all you guys for listening to the first hour, and we will be continuing this in the members section and uh, continue talking about the Chi of Change. Some fascinating stuff here. Uh, condemnation without investigation is the height of ignorance. The love you deny is the pain you carry. And we will see you guys in a second. Change. We wish to see in the world. Freedom's calling, I feel the fire that's deep inside us. Everybody wants change, but tell me who will guide us. To the leaders that pass away, put up your lighters. It's a beautiful struggle, but it cannot divide us. We're the ones that we've always been waiting for. See yourself in the mirror, but open up the door. Walk through it and feel the love to watch your pores. Be the light, life's purpose is to feel joy. Metaphysical, lyrical, standing up for truth. The only one to make change is walking in your shoes. Be the example, don't complain about the news. Making music and serving the world with the loo. Now you can be the same, or you can be the change. Change, find strength from inside, break through the chains. No one to blame, nothing to prove. You create your reality, it's up to you. Be the change that you wanna see in the world. I got me live for peace. Aspire to be so mother fights for the beliefs. Like Martin Luther King. Aspire to be that love, that light, like Christ. Live life for the moment of need. And if you believe in Jehovah, Allah, Buddha, Christian, it's love to me. So yearns for peace in a world that's flooded with war History's littered with body scar Trying to settle the score To maintain an archaic platform of power and greed People fight for land out of survival and need So I'm killing my television and I'm planting a seed To fill my head with knowledge that I'm seeing received Due to the media propaganda killing my creed Or what don't kill me make me stronger Feel a strength when I bleed Fight for interest and forwards attached to feet They try to sell you anything in this world Nothing for free Land, air, fire, and water They keep up in the ante While the anti-proletariat told the powers to be But we keep fighting, survive and thrive and recycle and rhyme and we constantly incline and we see through the lying and blind they actively keep trying to keep you from asking the why the change that you want to see in the world I got me live for peace aspire to be so on the fights for the beliefs like Martin Luther King aspire to be that love that light like Christ this life for the moment of need and if you believe in Jehovah Allah Buddha Christian it's love to me we find solutions different possibilities
possibilities, creating organizations while aspiring to be inspiring young minds to see. Building life skills, nurturing creativity, fulfilling the youth's basic needs, listening actively, teaching the tools to succeed. Positive role models we plan to see. The roots drink the water which feed the trees. Someone help me. Giving back is my responsibility. Be the change that you want to see in the world. Like Gandhi, live for peace. Aspire to be. So I'm on the fights for the